It can seem hard to find a bigger tit in British politics than Matt Hancock. But this weekend, one made himself known. He's called Jonathan Code. Joining me to discuss this is none other than media and crisis PR lawyer Jonathan Code, who was actually recently asked to act for Matt Hancock. Thank you for joining me. Yes, I have to say that's disappointing because I made it absolutely clear to your programme. I asked them not to disclose that. And that is very, very poor journalism. Okay, well, it seems like, uh, I mean, are you okay to carry on or is that the kind of thing that means you don't want to carry on? No. I'm going to apologise for having that in the... Because I I disagree with what a lot of you say, but you've you've stood there in front of a a baying audience throwing poo left, right and centre at Matt Hancock when your own television station has engaged in correspondence with me where I explained... That, that one, you know, I'm in a position to be able to comment on this and mention that I'd been approached by Matt Hancock. I asked you not okay. to mention that. Well, I apologise that we've, that I anybody, that we've anybody, mentioned Anybody's tempted to take you seriously or your programme seriously, here's a good reason well, not well, to. in this moment, I can apologise for including that information. I've just been given the actual email that you sent to my producer, which they'd like me to read out. Um, as a courtesy to the lady who approached me to act for MH, Matt Hancock, I would be grateful if it was mentioned that he asked me to act for him. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it seems that you actually... That you're absolutely to... right that it's my mistake I missed out the knot. I take all of that back. My abs... abs <laughs> my abject apologies. You're right and I'm wrong. No, fair, uh, fair dues. I, I'm absolutely okay. wrong about that. My apologies. That was Jonathan Code, a crisis and PR manager. Uh, if you work in crisis and PR, it's very important to recognise where to put a knot and where not to put a knot. Um, that was incredibly embarrassing. For his part, and I suppose to add even more confusion into the story, Matt Hancock has now denied that anyone from his team ever asked this man for his services. I doubt he will be getting them from now on, whatever the case, whatever was the truth. Um, Of course, the reason Matt Hancock wants a lawyer in the first place is because the journalist Isabel Oakeshott passed on all his WhatsApp messages to the Telegraph. She was also in a blockbuster interview this weekend. Here she is speaking to Kathy Newman, who wants to know why Oakeshott gave her story to the Telegraph when she has a contract with rival organisation Talk TV. I'm just interested why you decided to go with the Telegraph when you do work for Talk TV, and you know that's in a you know a media Cathy, organisation with it, other it, newspapers. If your focus is on this angle, I will terminate the interview now because this is not what I've come on here to talk about. Well, I'm talking about you hitting the headlines, and this is part of the story. But I mean, let's talk about my what my, arrange- next. my my work arrangements are not part of the story. Actually, they're actually absolutely nothing to do with it. So you had, but you have no qualms about taking this story to the Telegraph. You're happy with how that went. I'm going to terminate the interview, okay? Well, this is the last... You- this, is, this is my last warning, okay? I'm going to terminate the interview. I've not come on here to justify where the story was placed or how I chose to go about that. I've come but on you- here to talk about the story and, and the fact that you have started wheeling out inaccurate figures about my contract or any working arrangement I have had, I think that is frankly unprofessional. Well, let's talk, we're talking about your story that has hit the headlines. You no, you're not. You're headlines. talking about my salary. That's what you've been talking about. Well, no, I'm not talking about what your salary anymore. With you? I'm not what talking about your salary. Do you? Do you want to talk about your salary? I How want to talk about pay? the story that has played out this week. I How much if you're, do you pay, are you, Kathy? <laughs> I haven't hit the headlines. You've hit the headlines, Isabel. Well, maybe Let's, if you broke some stories, you would. <laughs> Well, I've broken a couple of stories this week since you mentioned oh, it, but don't they? worry about that. I, I'm not going to go into that because I haven't hit that. Well, this is not me well, being no, interviewed on this. Stuff. Right. What I want to ask you, Isabel, is here we, here we are that you ripped up an NDA to dump right. Matt Hancock in it. You dumped Vicky have... Price in it. Wait, let me finish. She ended up going to prison on the back of correspondence with you about speeding points. You based an unsubstantiated allegation that a former prime minister engaged in a sex act with a dead pig on a single source. You also published text messages and emails with the Leave.eu founder Aaron Banks, which were shared with you privately. What I want to ask you, Isabel, is how can any source trust you again? Well, Isabel Oakeshott, I'm afraid, has terminated that interview. 
No, I don't have much sympathy for Isabella. Like, she's a raving right winger. And I think, you know, the, the reason she has leaked these messages to the Telegraph is because she wants, she, you know, she has a very clear agenda. So do the Telegraph. They want people to say, oh, the lockdown was all wrong. COVID wasn't as serious as, as everyone made out. It was just politicians trying to scare you. I mean, scientists making stuff up. I mean, I suppose they, I should say that they haven't said scientists have made stuff up, but, but that's the general impression. Um, I, I, I get the sense that they are trying to give. They have an obvious agenda. But in that interview, I was on Isabel Oakeshott's side. I mean, one, because she's hilarious. She said, well, I'm asking you these questions because you're in the headlines. Well, maybe you'd be in the headlines if you broke some stories. It's like, it's very good comeback. And her point, I think, was absolutely right. Why do Kathy Newman's listeners on talk, or sorry, on Times Radio, which is Murdoch owned, care that Isabel Oakeshott has a contract with Talk TV, also Murdoch owned, as a commentator, and then gave a story to The Telegraph instead, right? Who cares? It's the most insular media bubble gotcha I could possibly imagine. Um, and I think Kathy Newman ended up looking a lot sillier than Isabel Oakeshott did there. Even if Isabel Oakeshott comes up across as more of a an odd character, let's say. At least she, you know, she brings some interest to the story. Um, let's talk about these leaks, though. As I say, they don't seem as explosive to me as The Telegraph has been making out. They have an agenda, but they do show Matt Hancock to be pretty shameless in his desire for self-promotion. Now, this is a message from early on in the pandemic when promising news first emerged about the Oxford vaccine. So Matt Hancock is speaking to one of his closest aides at the time, Jamie Joku Goodwin. And Hancock begins by saying this, front pages on vaccine are unreal. You were totally right. I must own this. I need to meet this scientist who is at the same Oxford college I was at. <laughs> And then the, the advisor says, yep, papers see it as the way out. They will forgive you for being in favour of lockdown if they think you are working night and day for a vaccine. They've also printed this exchange from January 2021. So that's when the medicines agency cut the time for approving new vaccines. So we'd all get them quicker. Now, it's between Hancock and his media advisor at the time, Damon Poole. And Hancock says this, send me the mail story. And then Damon Poole sends him um, the story of vaccine approval is finally cut from 20 days to five. Um, MHRA briefing in pretty sure that's one of the agencies that works these things out. And Matt Hancock says, weird, but isn't that good news? Is it true? Damon says, believe it's true, but they can't be blind signing everyone. Um, and then Matt Hancock said, I called for this two months ago, all in capitals. This is a Hancock triumph. And if it is true, we need to accelerate massively. And then Damon Paul says, OK. And Matt Hancock saying, this is a Hancock triumph. Of course, while Hancock was keen to praise himself, some of those working with him were less impressed. Clive Dix was deputy chair of the vaccine task force for most of 2020. He would go on to be its chair when Kate Bingham resigned. So she got knighted for her services in that job. Now, Clive Dix has written this in The Telegraph. I worked with Matt Hancock the whole time I was at the vaccine task force, and he was, without doubt, the most difficult of all the ministers because he didn't take time to understand anything. <laughs> he was all over the place, a bit like a headless chicken. He often made statements saying, we are going to do X and we want to let the world know about it. But we were dealing with an uncertain situation in bringing the vaccines forward. The manufacturing process was brand new and any process like this is fraught with problems, which we need to fix as we go along. But normally you would spend two or three years stress testing something like this. Hancock was laying down timelines by saying things like, we will vaccinate the whole population. And these timelines drove his behavior. And he goes on to say this. When we said that AstraZeneca vaccine had manufacturing problems, that is when Hancock panicked. He didn't believe us. We were working night and day to make it work. And he was turning around and saying, I have said the UK population will all get vaccinated. But we couldn't change the nature of the process. And he didn't get that. He thought it was like procurement. That is where his behavior came from. He panicked. And that led to them going to India and taking vaccines that had been meant for the developing world. I thought that ethically it was very wrong to take doses. This is Clive Dix talking. I thought that ethically it was very wrong to take doses that it had been agreed would go to the developing world just to meet an arbitrary timeline. This is why I ended up resigning, because I could no longer advise a government that acted on these terms. Now, I think what you'll find is, you know, in defense, Hancock might say, yes, I'm, you know, I'm an embarrassing guy. Sometimes if you look through WhatsApp, people say embarrassing things. But what I was doing is I was annoying the scientists by putting really ambitious targets that no one believed were possible. But then we drove them to meet those targets. This is what I did. And this is so great. That's undoubtedly how he would justify all of this. I think that statement from Clive Dix is quite important there, because basically what he's saying is, look, these, these arbitrary targets didn't 
just, you know, the consequence wasn't just that people sped up what they were doing if they did at all. What actually happened was to, to meet these arbitrary targets, we ended up diverting vaccines meant for the developing world to come to the UK, a rich country. You know? so, so I think that's quite powerful testimony from the former chair of the vaccine task force saying we, we had to make decisions which I as a, you know, as a scientist, as a, as a policymaker thought was ethically incorrect because we were taking vaccines from poorer people to bring them to richer places to vaccinate people that needed to be vaccinated less urgently. And this was also Matt Hancock could get some good, good headlines. Um, I, I just want that one phrase from Matt Hancock again. What does he say? This is a Hancock, this is a Hancock triumph. The thick of it was a documentary, I think. <laughs> like <laughs> every week, there's a new episode. Actually, this is all political, like pure political theater, isn't it? Like you said, I agree with what you said that this is kind of feeding the lockdown skeptics and um, giving them what they want with this information. Uh, but the conspiracy theorist in me is wondering if this was leaked kind of on purpose. And this is my, obviously my own opinion as a spin, like the leaks are a spin into an anti-lockdown narrative that with the purpose of explaining Britain's poor economic situation as being caused by the lock lockdown rather than other structural issues or long-term structural problems that have been the case since Thatcher, nearly every nation implemented some sort of lockdown um, and many of them have now begun um, to recover economically, but Britain has not. Explaining this away through the lockdown fails to account for the actual problems. It's strange in that, like lots of the articles in this collection of lockdown files public, published by The Telegraph seem to consist of saying like, Boris Johnson knew that we didn't need a lockdown. And what they find is one message where Boris Johnson has read a comment piece, misunderstood it, and said, are you sure we need to do this? Da, 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 da. Like he's misunderstood something. And then down the line, the scientific advisors say, no, you've misunderstood this. So that the headline should be Boris Johnson initially misunderstood something. But they keep giving it the headline, Boris Johnson knew lockdown wasn't needed. It was like, no, Boris Johnson was mistaken and then admitted he was mistaken a little bit too late, usually. Because if you let the infections go out of control, as we talked about at the time, then you need to have a longer lockdown and more people die. So that's what happened. And I think the Telegraph are trying to rewrite history by using these... WhatsApp messages in, in quite a cynical and opportunistic way, I think. But nonetheless, it's fun to laugh at Matt Hancock. Yeah.